Sunera Shibir from Department of Applied Psychology. I am serving as a lecturer over there and I welcome you on this PhD symposium titled as Social, Socially Inclusive and Equitable Education as a Driver for Sustainable Development. This event is organized by Department of Applied Psychology, Lahore College for Women University, Pakistan and Schools of Psychology, University of Bolton, UK. This project is basically uh, funded and uh, enabled by British Council and uh, Higher Education Committee, Pakistan. Uh, this Park UK Education Gateway uh, Mobility Program basically provided opportunity for the students to collaborate from the University of UK and University of uh, Lahore College from University from Pakistan. This collaboration has been groundbreaking and uh, it has uh, enabled our students to get exposure, uh, research exposure and personal as well. Uh, by far, this mobility program has been a huge success and why wouldn't it be as it is being led by Dr. Aksa Shabir as PI and uh, Professor Dr. Amna Mozam and Dr. Naveed Iqbal as co-PI. With no further ado, I would like to formally begin this session uh, and I would like to invite our one of the undergraduate students uh, for the recitation of Holy Quran so that we can begin the session. Please, Zakia. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان لا تتعو في الميزان واقيم الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسر الميزان والأرض وضعها للعنام فيها فاكهة والنقل ذات الأكمام فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان صدق الله العظيم In the name of Allah, the most beneficent and the merciful the most merciful taught the Quran, created man the sun and the moon move by price calculation and the stars and the tree postrates and the heaven he raised and imposed the balance that uh, you not transgress with the balance and the established weight in the justice and do not make deficient the balance in the earth he laid from the creators there in a fruit and palm tree having snits for a date and grains having hugs and snitted plants so which of the favor you lord would you deny exactly now uh, i would like to call professor dr amna mozum professor dr amna mozum is a social scientist with focus on cutting edge re research in psychological sciences she has been instrumental in uplifting department of psychology since she joined lcwu in various roles as a chairperson of this department uh, she has started phd program in 2012 as a founder member and remain dedicated for transmitting latest knowledge for scholars at her best. She has received Best University Teacher Award from HEC from year 2022. She is visiting scientist uh, at the Head University Canada and Pace University New York. She has developed the World Health Organization Rehabilitation Policy uh, 2030 as a world leader for mental health group. She is working as a core member of technical work for the launch of the Presidential Telemental Helpline. She is a PI and co-PI for several research projects. She is chair member of several committees at national and international levels. Currently, she is serving as a tenured professor and chairperson at LCWU. Uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Uh, Amna Wazan. Thank you very much, uh, Zunaira, for this uh, introduction. And Zunaira has not introduced herself, by the way. Zanaira is a very talented faculty member of Department of Applied Psychology, the College for Women University. She has recently joined as a lecturer. She's a clinical psychologist, 
and uh, she is a very active member of her department and she is doing a lot of work since she has joined. So um, thank you for being with us. So I feel little excited, little um, humble. It's a mix of so many emotions being there. Welcoming all of you for this uh, very prestigious PhD symposium and it makes more meaning to me because uh, since we have started it has been around more than 12 years that our PhD program is growing each day. So I think this is a, a very uh, good time that we are sitting with uh, some of the very eminent graduates who have uh, uh, passed from this program a couple of years back and now mashallah doing wonderful jobs in, in their respective departments. And then we have those who are uh, just entered into PhD program and they are looking forward to uh, gain so much more. Then there are the students who have, uh, you know, uh, secured their uh, PhD synopsis defense and they are looking forward to complete it very soon. So a lot of learned, inspirational and, uh, you know, motivated people are sitting together. And not to forget that two very special people are also sitting here who are one of, uh, you can say, the driving force behind, you know, leading this uh, whole PhD program. Our very own, very respected and very dear Professor Dr. Sara Shahid. Uh, I think this has been impossible without her dynamism, without her motivation, without her, you know, vision, which has translated the PhD program in a shape which is in front of you today. And not to forget our very dear, very own, my very good friend, Dr. Subha Malik, who has been with us throughout these years in all the thick and thin. So, uh, to kar sakti. And then also I would like to welcome Dr. Saki Brahman, who is with us and who is going to talk about uh, essentials of leadership today, because we have heard that he is a very transformational, motivational speaker within the university. So we have, you know, uh, asked him to be with us today and, you know, inspire you with how to become a good leader after completing your uh, PhD. So uh, this department has a very bright and vibrant history with so many wonderful people who have been serving in this department. Uh, and uh, this department has been incepted 75 years back. It's a long time and you know, whatever we have achieved so far could not be possible without the, you know, um, the kind of the um, hard work the seniors have been doing from, uh, you know, they have been uh, passing through different kind of, you know, graduation systems, annual systems, semester system, and so many other things which they have been doing throughout their past. and they. So when we joined as, uh, you know, the new uh, members of this department, they were kind of an inspiration to us because we look forward to see them that how they, they have a good relationship with their students, how do uh, they mentor us and many, many other things. Ms. Chini Asad is not here, but I would like to mention that she was one of the person who used to motivate us a lot. When I joined, I think in 2008, I have published an article that was my first article out of my PhD uh, work. And she was the one who gave me a very nice card with the statements of congratulations that this is your first article and many more to come. I still have kept safe with me. So I think it's all about inspiring other, motivating other and things like that. So myself, as far as concerned, I joined this university in 2009 and uh, not to be mentioned as a source of pride for myself, but I think this is something which has given a lot to others. I was the first PhD member in Department of Applied Psychology, uh, but not in uh, Department of Applied Psychology. Uh, we have very few people who were either doing PhD or uh, only I think Dr. Hamala Khalid was the one from HD uh, who has done PhD at that time. She was the uh, acting registrar as well when I joined. So after Dr. Hamala Khalid, I was the first uh, from the university service who have uh, completed the PhD. And I think after that, uh, there was, uh, alhamdulillah, with the passage of time, lot of people who, uh, you know, keep coming the department and who, uh, you know, uh, keep coming the university in social sciences uh, who had uh, PhDs. So, uh, in 2011, uh, one fine day, Dr. Sara called me in her office and she said that, uh, Amna, uh, we are started, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking forward to have a PhD program in our department and you have to develop the courses. 
I was very happy and excited and we both sat together. I think there was a, a gender studies counseling center department. There was a PC and I sat there and I worked till I think late in evening and we were able to develop some good stuff. At that time, Dr. Sibiya Mansoor was a vice chancellor and she was very, you know, encouraging, uh, encouraging towards, you know, starting the new programs. So, Dr. Sara and me, we both worked on the, you know, course outlines and things and then BOS, BOF and all those stuff has been, you know, they, they were very, very challenging times. You can, you know, uh, at that time, um, the feedback used to be very critical and uh, Dr. Sara will confirm me that it was not easy to even begin with, you know, we have a lot of challenges to face. And then very soon, uh, Dr. Subha joined us and we three have started the program and uh, you know started teaching and mentoring and since 2011 I think there was not even a single session that in which we received students less than three or four uh, but we had students maximum as much as of 15 in number so it was a very you know engaging program with a lot of uh, people coming towards it and gradually we got a very good repute and alhamdulillah you all are sitting here and you can confirm that um, um, not to not to be you know kya kena chahiye ta kabur nahi karna chahiye but I think uh, that in uh, Punjab and in especially in Lahore the PhD program of Lahore College for Women University has been very well recognized and people like to come and join us and I think this is all because of the good faculty because of the environment we have tried to create so far even I remember that there used to be the times that when especially I'm referring towards the those uh, supervisors more who were at the beginning now alhamdulillah we have a lot more who have done PhD from this department and now they are in, uh, working in a capacity of a supervisors as well but referring towards the initial times I think we have never been differentiated between any of our students we try to support anyone and everyone so that was I think a huge uh, success of this program and then um, later on, uh, Dr. Nahid Dita also joined the program. She was also, uh, you know, supervising uh, students and then many more to come. Um, so far, uh, since 2011 and uh, to till now, 34 students has been uh, graduated. And uh, Alhamdulillah, they all are doing an uh, excellent job in their areas. Now, um, looking at that, who prefer to take admission in our department. I think um, I feel very proud that there are students from mostly from different you know colleges and universities who prefer to join our department and um, I think one day they will be alumni of LCWU in all the universities of Punjab at least because from UCP, from Kanade, from Comsed, from FC and uh, from UMT and from where not. We have uh, from different colleges. We have you know, PhD students from all these places who are, you know, uh, who, who took admission in our department and they are the part of our program. So, uh, I think that uh, uh, those who have been graduated so far and they are being working in our, either our department in our in other departments, I think they must confirm that this PhD program has been instrumental in developing uh, uh, themselves a valuable transferable skills because I think you learned a lot during, a, uh, during this PhD program and you deliver it to others. So that's uh, something which is, uh, um, you know, very commendable that you learn problem solving behaviors, you laid persecution, you laid good communi communication skills and things like that. So I think that um, not to take much time, I just uh, wanted to say that I feel very happy and very proud today that uh, uh, the day we begin, the, it seems that we have uh, no resources with us. We, we were not sure that how long we will be able to pull it. But with the hard work, with the dedication, with the permission of Dr. Sara, I will say that I was alone and 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 I was alone. So Alhamdulillah, the whole department of applied psychology is now PhD and that's really something huge to celebrate. So, <laughs> so um, I think that uh, today uh, when I look at my department, I feel very proud that uh, next to me is Dr. Amna Bed Khwaja. She's also a PhD from our department and she's now working as an associate professor in our department. So this gives us a lot of, you know, uh, pride and lot of inspiration that 
this is how you all can you know do things and you all can come to this stage then dr indeen anjum is not here today but uh, we had made i think ikra has made a small video of phd scholars which is uh, going to be played right after myself so dr indeen anjum is also associate professor in virtual university and she is going to be professor very soon uh, she was my student as well uh, supervisor as well so you know ek ustad ko bahut khushi hoti hai jab aapka apna student jo hai wo professor hota hai so i think in then many more i think i can see dr naima hasan sitting here dr hina sultan sitting here uh, dr shamin ijaz sitting here so they all are the very brilliant wonderful students dr how can i forget dr bisma is sitting here dr saima is sitting here dr umeru bab kazmi my very dear own pehli mari graduate regular program ki she is sitting here dr maryam babar so lot of people who has been graduated from this department and they are doing exceptionally talented work are also being the part of you know uh, university and the hawk college for women university and department in the capacity of either teachers in capacity of either you know external examiner in capacity of member of any committee maybe but they all are contributing towards the growth of department so with this i would like to take leave and i wish best of luck for this symposium and i hope that you all will enjoy learning today thank you very much Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kamla, for your kind words. Next, we have uh, Professor Dr. Jerome Carson uh, as a guest uh, guest of honor with us. Uh, he could be joined, but uh, I'll be introducing uh, him. That uh, he is a senior professor at Schools of Psychology at University of Bolton. Uh, he is also a very instrumental and focal person for the collaboration between the uh, University of Bolton and Lahore College for Women University. And there has been an MOU signed between these two universities. And uh, now we have uh, a video. that uh, for the aid this introduction next we have uh, professor dr sara shahid with us uh, for the keynote address uh, professor dr sara shahid uh, is serving as a professor of psychology <laughs> at fc university lahore uh, uh, she has also served as the chairperson gender and developmental studies and professor of applied psychology lahore college for women university Uh, she had many honors and award to her names uh, mentioning a few uh, she has been awarded by lahore college for women university in 2019 uh, she has also won best university teacher award uh, awarded by uh, hcc uh, in 2014 and she has been uh, hcc approved phd supervisor as well uh, she has gone under various uh, training and workshop programs national and and international level Uh, she has various uh, experiences of collaboration with foreign universities being the principal investigator and coordinator of a 3 year university partnership between global gender program george washington university usa and department of gender uh, gender and developmental studies lahore college for women university she has also established a linkage between lcwu and asian institute of technology thailand department of gender and developmental studies previously had an mou with gender of Deve uh, development studies at ait in uh, 2007 uh, now please uh, dr sara shahir if you may join us hello assalam alaikum good morning uh, is it working the mic okay so i have to use my voice na yes okay so first of all thank you very much dr amna for this providing me this opportunity uh, to come here and talk to everybody and for your generous introduction and um, considering me as one of the pioneers for this program thank you and congratulations also for your success and um, having all of your um, most of the phd uh, graduates here today so when you say it is um, keynote speech or keynote address it makes it very very formal so uh, okay you can call it a keynote address but i'm just going to talk about a number of things and uh, dr amna took us down the memory lane and i could remember many of the things like she remember the first time when we had a meeting about starting this program uh and even before that because this department has been a very fertile and productive department and as dr amna said it was set up about 75 years ago and it has had uh, some very vibrant leaders and vibrant faculty members 
and who were here for 30, 35 years of their professional life, and they contributed. So this department produced many graduates, many famous personalities. Uh, this department, um, I mean, even uh, when this department, Dr. Amna started its MS program, uh, MSc program, even then very few departments uh, in Punjab had that uh, master's program. Then this department took, uh, as, as I said, very productive, uh, took a lead and uh, this department has been a pioneer in introducing health psychology in Pakistan. This department was the first one to start a program, uh, actually a course in health psychology. Later on, 2009, I think, they started uh, MS in health psychology. Once again, this department was a pioneer. And then, as Dr. Ramna said, uh, they started a uh, um, PhD program. And one of the special features of this program was our emphasis on health related uh, topics and subjects. And uh, since we were um, just three musketeers who started it, actually two and then three, so and took, took up the challenge. Uh, so and therefore, we had to think about the areas of specialization that we had in our mind. So our emphasis initially was gender, health, and geriatrics. So some of us wanted to work on aging, well-being associated with aging, um, gender related, so everything is gender related, we could do that. Then we moved on to um, industrial organizational as one of the domains that our students wanted to study on uh, leadership. Um, I don't remember everyone's topics, but uh, uh, if I remember, uh, bullying, I think um, Dr. Mbreen and Dr. Rubab, she worked on uh, leadership, some aspect of Adjustment problems in university students, yes. So uh, a variety of subjects, so uh, this is how we started. And why I feel that we need to talk about this, because every department, everywhere in the world starts their programs and they then make it a success later on. But when we talk about uh, starting a program, especially um, postgraduate program, a doctoral program, in a country like Pakistan, where not everybody is um, willing to send their daughters uh, to school, for example. So we always, this, it is a different, like work, my work working at Lahore College for Women University was an exceptional uh, experience for me because I had not worked previously in a, uh, for a longer duration. For some time I was in a women only university. So it has, it is a completely different experience from teaching in a co-educational institution because, and we, I think all of us do that. We keep telling our students that you are one of the most fortunate persons in this um, country because in a country where many people would not send their daughters to a school, your parents sent you to school and then your parents allowed you to join a college and then they allowed you to come to a university and then yet they allowed you to pursue your studies and do your doctoral studies also. So the women who are sitting here are perhaps a, a batch of most fortunate and most successful women in the sense that they conquered all, all the barriers. And they are here and uh, in a university teaching other women. So it is not just teaching a course or anything, but it is bringing about a change in the families the number of women that you are teaching, you are teaching the, at least that number of families also. And once we tried to calculate how we did that, I think uh, it was uh, in Dr. Sabiha Mansoor's tenure. So how many people have we impacted? So if you had uh, taught 100 students, 100 families, 100 families, on average, the family size in Pakistan is seven. So multiplied by seven and their daughters get married and they, they teach others and uh, spread their impact. So maybe thousands. So in, in fact, the impact has been in millions also. So we, and uh, the challenges, and Dr. Amna said, we had a number of challenges. The, initially, uh, that we were very few in number. And uh, of course, the university, without the patronage of uh, a strong leadership, you could not start. The vice chancellor encouraged us a lot. 
uh, for starting this program. But if we compare ourselves from, with um, some other universities, um, and as we read about the glass ceiling effect for women and the glass elevator for men, so men get that elevator, which is invisible. So everything becomes easy for them. So if you uh, are a man who had studied in, uh, let's say, GC University Lahore, things become very easy for you because many of your class fellows or seniors are in the bureaucracy. So your files move, your files run. So and if you come from a women only university, people have this attitude, okay, okay, women, uh, they want it. Okay, it will be good if they get it. Uh, it won't matter if it is a bit slow. So some challenges were there, but uh, there was strong encouragement, there was strong teamwork, there was strong support by the administration, and without that, and of course by the HEC also. Because when we sent our program, I, I think it did not come back with any objection. So, so uh, the programs were made in such a good way that <laughs> they had to be approved. Also, could you me to huh, never. So it was a success, and um, it became popular. And our uh, students who graduated, um, they also contributed, and they were so productive, and they wrote, and they published, and which uh, spread the word. And people then knew that this university was producing some very capable people. There are people who have been writing, who have been publishing, who have, who have been working like Dr. Amna Obed, working on their own uh, therapeutic model also. So pe people know that. So it is no longer seen as just a women-only university, one of the various departments. It is now known as a department uh, which is very actively taking part in uh, very productive activities. And I, uh, now they have started so many other new programs. So they are adventurous, and they, ha they are enthusiastic, and they have that zeal which is required, and they are a good team. So with this, I think I would like to conclude. I will thank you, the administration, and the organizers. Dr. Ramna, thank you once again. And all the best to all the doctors that, and the would-be doctors this department has produced. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarah Shahid. Next we have, next we have uh, Dr. Saqib Rahman with us. Uh, he is an assistant professor, Department of Management Sciences, Lahore College for Women University. And uh, he is an HR professional and expert in delivering soft skills training. He is super talented and amazing speaker. So we'll hear from him onwards. as uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Amna and other organizations who have given me the opportunity to talk in the symposium, Socially Inclusive and Equitable Education uh, as a Driver for Sustainable Development. Today, I'm not going to talk about the leaders required for sustainable development. Some other day, if Dr. Amna will call me, so I will surely talk about it, okay, who the leaders who can have actually the sustainable development in the organizations. Uh, today, I'll talk about little, uh, means lot of big leaders are already sitting in front of me. I'm feeling very little in fr uh, talking in front of them. But uh, I'm not uh, talking so much, but my eight concept jo, that I want to clear and uh, I want to understand that everyone should be very clear about this sentence or this concept. Uh, man, ya humans, are the social animals. From the childhood, we are listening this word, man is a social animal. But I believe this phrase has been changed. Humans are the social learners, not they are the animals. So we believe, as an educationist, we believe humans are the social learners. And if we talk about the learners, at the top, teachers are contributing the learning environment, establishing a learning environment. Secondly, the scientists, the PhD people, and the scholars. So this is our responsibility that we have to create a learning environment. And how? 
for learning environment we can have a three kinds of leaders three kinds of leaders the one is impressive leader second is influential leader and the third is inspirational leader impressive influential inspirational okay and impressive means you meet so many personalities uh, daily jinko aap milke to you feel ke very impressive yaar zabardast kya baat ki hai yaar kamal kar diya kya baatein hain kya personality hai kya communication hai this is called impressive theek hai when you get your home aap apne ghar mein wapas jayenge you will forget all the things because you were only impressed with the leadership so impressive leader can have the good personality can have the good communication can good have can have the good wearings and can 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 have the good face to impressive then it comes the influential leaders influential leaders are who have the power means in the organizations we can see so many leaders they have the power and they have the influential capacity hum majboor ho jate hain apne boss se influence hone ke because he has the power power of punish power of giving reward power of uh, sometimes expert opinion so two time two kinds the first is impressive which can have a very short term impact on the followers because yaad rakhiyega leaders ka concept followers ke bagair complete nahi hota ek leader ek follower impressive leaders can have the short term impact on to the followers influential leaders have the impact during you stay on the environment up till or according to the or within the environment you can feel the impact of that leader influential leader and the third one jo ki dr amna ne apni speech ka aagaz kiya usse ke inspiration to usi waqt maine decide kiya ki we need to talk on it so inspirational leaders what the inspirational leaders are inspirational leaders have so many components so many factors but i will talk some of the some of the uh, factors that are important that i consider for women leadership it is essential that you should develop in yourself because you are the future leaders so you should have those factors those elements in yourself and inspirational leaders are those can inspire the followers inspire means ke once you met the leader maybe in your office maybe at some uh, social place maybe in television but aap usse kuch effect lete hain you receive something from the inspirational leader aapka dil chahta hai ke what the words that leader is speaking i should follow those words ek ek lafz हमारे दिमाग के ऊपर बिल्कुल इंपैक्ट करता है जाकर हिट करता है सो दिस इज योर चॉइस एट दिस स्टेज माय 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 डियर स्कॉलर्स यू वांट टू बी अ इंप्रेसिव यू वांट टू बी अ इंफ्लुएंशियल और यू वांट टू बी अ इंस्पिरेशनल लीडर फॉर इंस्पिरेशन समथिंग वन थिंग इज वेरी 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 इंपॉर्टेंट इंस्पिरेशन लीडर वही हो सकता है जो खुद प्रैक्टिस करता है मसलन मैं अगर यहां पर आकर आपको किसी चीज का लेसन देता हूं कि भाई ये किया करो वो किया करो वो किया करो अगर उसको मैं खुद प्रैक्टिस नहीं करता तो उसका इंपैक्ट बहुत शॉर्ट टर्म होगा इंप्रेसिव इंपैक्ट होगा इंस्पिरेशनल इंपैक्ट नहीं होगा इफ आई फॉलो दो रूल्स दैट रूल्स आई एम टीचिंग टू यू आई एम टेलिंग टू यू तो उसका इंपैक्ट इंस्पिरेशनल होता है उसका इंपैक्ट यू नोट आपको इवन यू नोट थिंक to follow your leaders so you have to be a inspirational leader for inspirational leader you need one thing that is a motivation motivation for your followers acha ek aur baat yahan pe main clear karta chalu ki once you are leader at all places you cannot be a leader ye zaruri nahi hai ki aap ek jagah pe leader hain aur aap apna haq samajh lenge ki har jagah main leader hu nahi aise nahi hota once you are leader at second place you may you may be a follower and and the third place you may be again a leader right so in humans leader followers 
इट इज अ कॉम्बिनेशन समटाइम्स यू आर लीडर समटाइम्स यू आर फॉलोअर इसके लिए हम एक कॉन्सेप्ट यूज करते हैं जो इन दोनों को मिलाता है दैट इज कॉल्ड टीम प्लेयरशिप अ गुड टीम प्लेयर इज अ लीडर जैसे वो मैच हार जाओ तो पिच यू खाड़ दो ये कोई लीडरशिप नहीं है ठीक है मैच हारो तो अगले मैच का इंतजार करो कि हम अगला मैच जीतेंगे दिस इज कॉल्ड टीम प्लेयरशिप सो अ लीडर इज हैविंग द कैपेसिटी और कैपेबिलिटी ऑफ टीम लीडरशिप वन मोर थिंग जिसमें मैं बात करूंगा कि टीम लीडर जो होता है या इंस्पिरेशनल लीडर जो होता है उसके अंदर एक फैक्टर लाजमी है दैट इज मोटिवेशन मोटिवेट अदर्स टू मोटिवेट अदर्स टू मोटिवेट फॉलोअर्स राइट सो मोटिवेट अदर्स याद रखिए दिस होल वर्ल्ड इज अबाउट एनर्जी आई एम टेलिंग यू ये पूरी जो कायनात है इट इज अबाउट द एनर्जी समटाइम्स यू आर ट्रांसफरिंग द पॉजिटिव एनर्जी एंड समटाइम्स यू आर गिविंग द नेगेटिव एनर्जी टू द अदर्स क्योंकि साइंटिस्ट बैठे हैं लॉ ऑफ कंजर्वेशन ऑफ एनर्जी सेज कि एनर्जी रिमेन्स कॉन्स्टेंट एनर्जी ओनली ट्रांसफॉर्म्स पॉजिटिव से नेगेटिव में हो जाएगी नेगेटिव से पॉजिटिव में हो जाएगी सिर्फ ट्रांसफॉर्म होगी मींस यू मीट सो मेनी पीपल इन योर लाइफ डेली जो हमेशा आपसे नेगेटिव बातें करेंगे इतनी नेगेटिव ही पिछले दिनों में डेंगी हो गया तो यकीन कीजिए कि मैं ऑफिस आ गया मुझे इतनी नेगेटिविटी मिली मुझे लगा शायद मैं घर ही नहीं जा पाऊंगा मुझे लगा कि मैं उठ ही नहीं सकता अपनी सीट से देर सो मच नेगेटिविटी अराउंड यू बट इफ यू हैव द पॉजिटिविटी अराउंड यू यू विल फील पॉजिटिव सो माई डियर्स spend use or give positive energy to others give positive energy to your followers this is the only message through delivering the positive energy you can be a motivate to others and only wohi log motivate kar sakte hain kisi dusre ko jo khud motivated hain kyunki i i i started my discussion from the word ke usi एक्ट का उसी बात का इंपैक्ट होता है दूसरे पर अगर आप खुद उसकी प्रैक्टिस करते हैं अगर आप खुद प्रैक्टिस नहीं करते तो उसका शॉर्ट टर्म इंप्रेशन होता है इंप्रेसिव हो सकते हैं बट आप इंस्पिरेशनल नहीं हो सकते सो बी इंस्पिरेशनल बी प्रैक्टिकल एंड स्पेंड पॉजिटिव एनर्जी थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू सो मच डॉक्टर Uh, it was impressive influential <laughs> yes it it was <laughs> uh, next we have dr subha malik with us uh, she is the chairperson of department of applied psychology government graduate college for women uh, gulbarg lahore and uh, uh, she uh, won a project titled collaboration between lcwu and fccu for capacity building in gender studies under us park university partnership grant programs funded by us government administered by us um, efp she has been supervising ms and phd research students and has a number of local and international publications her research interests are resilience in coping disaster trauma uh, politics of gender and the gender uh, environment Uh, she served as visiting lecturer in the government of statistical and actuarial sciences new campus punjab university and lecturer of psychology in the department of special education she has been working as advisor for punjab public service commission do we have dr subha malik with us yes please <laughs> so assalam alaikum uh, many of you know me as a teacher also uh, i can see many of my dear very dear students here so uh, yes when um, um there so many connections in the hall college for women and when uh, dr amna asked me to uh, talk here and uh, this talk about my reflections well maybe uh, i can start with when initially i joined my phd program in punjab university and um, uh, i think it was um, dr amna was my um, fellow student and we were together in the program and dr sara was my senior so i think it was the second batch in uh, pu which um, we officially you know first regular batch first regular batch of uh, phd and it was um i think my first point that i would like to make here is that 
the students students nowadays are so lucky that you have this indigenous program phd program which is being offered in pakistani universities and students can come and enroll in it and get this higher degree here when <clears throat> in my days um, younger days when i thought of you know getting a masters or getting uh, getting an M ms degree didn't exist and phd's of course were not offered indigenously so people were you know going out and most it was so expensive so they would try to get scholarships and all but then hec uh, facilitated uh, students by starting the indigenous program which was a very big blessing and um, it was um, in when it started we had this uh, gmat pro which we had to clear and then we applied in the department then there of course there was an admission test and uh, they saw the credentials etc before giving the admission so it was very very difficult to get an admission in the phd program um but uh, gradually it uh, sort of you know things became smooth and um everybody learned from their previous mistakes and what facilitated students mostly it was about facilitating the students so um, again as dr sakib just said about um, negativity and positivity so one thing again <laughs> in um, where we did our phd from we learned like i think uh, amna myself and uh, dr sara always she's been such an optimist throughout my life as i can look back so uh, uh, there were so many hurdles in uh, in you know in pu when we were doing our degree there were so many hurdles which were um, you know we we just couldn't uh, uh, we just didn't know how to solve them because they were not uh, those, those hurdles were not uh, you know to facilitate us they were just there because of the politics existing in that institution or because of uh, you know various politics between the supervisors and uh, but i think alhamdulillah in lahore college uh one thing which i really look back is that all the supervisors all of us supervisors we really facilitated the students our students amongst us and we uh, try to um encourage them as much as possible and uh, uh, you know talked about uh, pos talk positively about uh, all the supervisors and you know tried our level best to make it very easy for them to uh go through all the uh, different phases which they had before completing their phd so um um also uh, there were a lot of um, i think in the department of applied psychology has always uh, been uh, very facilitative and even now when i have uh, i am not here in the university and i have my phd students who are uh, completing their degrees from the department um i'm very thankful to the department because uh i mean you know things just go very smoothly i would also like to remember dr tahira who was the controller of examinations and initially when our phd's were completing their degrees and their vivas were planned and everything and even the course outline was uh, you know repeatedly uh, re um, uh, revised and reviewed by dr tahira Uh, she was a very facilitative uh, person and you know uh, made it very easy for the students and for the staff so um, apart from that i would also uh, like to say that initially there was a phd admission committee here in the um, uh, this campus which i uh, dr sabiha told me to join that and uh, there were dr rehana and dr musfira were uh in charge of that uh, committee and i was facilitating them so i remember that uh, before the ad used to come in the newspaper um uh, dr sabia used to call a meeting and then um you know we um, i had to run about because i was the younger person with them and i had to run about uh, with all to all the departments and ask if they are offering the phd program in those days and you know what is the course outline what is the entry date what are the requirements and then the ad would come in the newspaper and then so on and so forth 
so um, also um, i think um, it is uh, atc also had like in punjab university and then uh, lahore college for women uh, university um, it was uh, this degree of um, phd is very uh, in the sense i see in the in my college nowadays uh, nearly all this atd staff has a uh, phil degree now nearly all of them have done their m m phil and most of them are now um uh, in the sense they are admitted in the uh, phd programs they are trying to complete the phd degree so government is also very facilitative towards this uh, uh, and obviously uh, being it is channelized through hec so um i had uh, my students i would also like to mention uh, the projects i think dr amna is going to show the projects now they you made a small uh, uh, this is this is a video i think ifra has made i haven't seen it but we really want to about all the students so um so anyway it was uh, if uh, uh, looking back i think now uh, the uh, phd program of applied uh, psychology has come a long way and uh, with the new buildings and new instruments and new uh, you know committee rooms and uh, the way vivas are planned and um, uh, so many um, uh, you know uh, such a lot of uh, people who facilitate you and the uh, you know asrbs uh, asrbs are held and obviously uh, with the support of dr amna um, things are going very smooth so um, i i think <laughs> That's it. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Subha. Uh, we have a video with us uh, to highlight all uh, these beautiful contributors. Uh, but before that, I would like to call uh, Dr. Rubab Kasvi to share her success story. Uh, she is the very first star of the department, as <laughs> she was the first one to enroll in the PhD program uh, in our department, and uh, she is serving as an assistant professor right now. Thank you. Yes, I'm Lekum. First of all, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. As you already know, I am Dr. Umair Bab Kazmi. I am working as an assistant professor in the Department of Applied Psychology, LCWU. I have almost 15 years of teaching experience and 17 research publications in ATC recognized and impact factor journals. Uh, i have uh, got certain certifications in uh, suicide prevention uh, psychological first aid from john hopkins university and queen mary university of london i completed my uh, phd in 2018 uh, when i was doing my ms in clinical psychology from gc university i realized that i am more interested in research and academia so i started my professional career from gc university as lecturer and then i joined lcw in 2010 uh joining lcw was the major event of my life uh, uh, the department of applied psychology launched its phd program in 2011 and i got uh, admission in 2012 uh, when i was teaching or during my teaching experience i observed that newly enrolled students experience different adjustment difficulties uh, which affect their academic achievement so i became curious to find out to explore the psychosocial factors of adjustment problems in university students i discussed this topic with my supervisor dr amna mozam and i am very thankful that she gave me the consent and guided me throughout my phd journey uh, i had a wonderful experience of uh, phd uh, of almost 6 uh, years but not the smooth one Uh, uh it had uh, some ups and downs and hurdles uh, let me share one of the experience with you people uh, our comprehensive exam uh, was scheduled and uh, i was uh, i had some uh, pregnancy related complications at that time just one day before my uh, comprehensive exam i came to know that i had a miscarriage uh, i became very upset and shocked uh, but allah gave me the strength and i gathered all my energy um uh, i just came for the uh, appeared for the exam and uh, had a surgical procedure on the same day so uh, i think uh, the uh, purpose of telling you this event is that i think the key elements of success are your clear goal setting motivation and your resilience 
uh, despite the department offered me three year study leave but I took only one year study leave and submitted my PhD work within the six months of that study leave time period. And uh, uh, lastly, I would like to thank my supervisor, uh, my family, my friends, Dr. Saima Ahmed, Dr. Mariam Bawar, and all those who helped me to achieve this goal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruba, for sharing your experience. I just yes. Say a few words yes, 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 please. It's only yours. Okay. I just wanted to mention at this point of the time that initially when I planned this symposium, to me each graduate is a success story and I really wanted to give a few minutes to each one of you because I think each one has their own journey, each one has come up with their own challenges and they have done wonders in their own ways. So I wanted to give chance to everyone to come here and speak about their success journey for a few minutes. But because of the time constraints, since we wanted to give more time to the technical sessions and we have a lot of wonderful presentations here as well, so the administration custom tailored the program and limit that success stories to only one. So I apologize that uh, initially the plan I shared was full of success stories and we have a lot of success stories, mashallah, coming here and who are not coming here today. But yeah, that wasn't, that wouldn't be possible. But uh, I think if we will be having some time in between, I would like to call all of them who are here for one or two minutes to talk about themselves. I hope that we will be able to meet the timeline today and give you some chance to come and talk about yourself. But even if you didn't get chance to come here, it doesn't mean that you are not a success story to us. We are all are proud of you, to, proud of all our graduates who pass from this department are and are doing excellent job in their respective departments. So thank you for coming today. Jo bhi yahan baithe hain aur jo nahi bhi aa sake. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramna. Itra, should we wait for this video to see if it works? She's working in Simon Fraser University, Canada, and her supervisor, her co-supervisor is Dr. Hari, and I am her supervisor. With time difference, we have recorded presentations. We have invited recorded presentations. Thank you so much. 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 Thank Contributing factors 
may be claimed as central nervous system, changes in body, nutrition, sleep, emotional development, body image, social contacts, drug abuse, and social media. The clinical framework which I had been following is uh, named as Problem Behavior Theory by Richard Tesser, and he mainly um, focused those biopsychosocial markers as um, uh, risk and protective factors to develop um, different biological, social, uh, environmental, personality, and behavioral um, uh, factors which may contribute uh, to different uh, lifestyles in an adolescent and uh, that can come out uh, as a compromising um, result uh, in form of different health, social roles, personal development and uh, preparation for adulthood uh, levels. The conceptual model of my study, uh, I combined both, both the biopsychosocial model with the problem theory and uh, focused the psychological, bisexual, social and ecological vulnerability with reference to the psychosocial vulnerabilities that is mediating between emotional behavior problems and psychological wellness. That is why the rational and significance of my study are very promising because uh, this is a pioneer work as this is one of the neglected topics that has never been studied before for male population in Pakistan. The male adolescent population has never been um, focused and been unserved for last many years where we see most of the studies on teen girls, issues or comparative studies on both genders. <coughs> There is no indigenous tool to assess the vulnerabilities that are exclusively targeting teen boys. To provide the strong basis for developing a tool, there is no latest data pertaining to age range of puberty that is this study investigated. There is no such study that can provide the causal relationship of psychosocial vulnerabilities in adolescent boys directly with emotional behavioral problems and psychological wellness. Our work is in line with the United Nations General Secretary's recommendations that due to uh, prevalence of substance use, violence and aggression in boys, more research attention is needed on how do boys develop such problem behaviors. The new IPNI guidelines for psychological practice with boys and men are also uh, instructing us to investigate the causal factors as well as to devise management programs for the well-being of male adolescents in, in order to strengthen the social connectedness. On the basis of these uh, rationale, uh, I devise uh, the uh, research question that uh, what is the effect of puberty in Pakistani boys because this would be uh, becoming the uh, main uh, variable uh, where I will be assessing the uh, experiences, expressions and manifestations of psychological and social problems of adolescent boys and what are the different types of psychosocial vulnerabilities these adolescent boys are suffering from. On the basis of these research questions, I made for the aims and objectives of the study that were to investigate the puberty stages of Pakistani boys, to develop a valid and reliable scale to assess the psychosocial vulnerabilities of adolescent boys, to investigate the relationship of psychosocial vulnerabilities of adolescent boys with emotional behavioral problems, to explore the relationship of psychosocial vulnerabilities of adolescent boys with psychological well-being, to investigate socio-demographic correlates of adolescent boys with psychosocial vulnerabilities such as age, grades, BMI, birth order, family system, etc. The main study hypothesis are based on uh, these three hypotheses that there will be a positive correlation between psychosocial vulnerabilities and emotional behavioral problems of adolescent boys. There will be a negative correlation between psychosocial vulnerabilities and psychological vulnerabilities of adolescent boys. Um, vulnerabilities have a mediating relationship between emotional behavior problems and psychosocial vulnerabilities of adolescent boys. Uh, the scale was translated and it was, uh, 
through the survey method 1337 teenage boys up to 18 years of age uh, were uh, recruited for this study the total development scale is um, uh, is uh, constructed with five indices or factors that are increase in height hair growth in outfits and pubic area variation in skin types voice thickening and hair growth on face with four point liquid scale translated and back translated in food Confirmatory factor analysis confirmed four factor structure and provided um, significant run back alpha from 0.76 to 0.84 for all the factors as well as for the food scale. Ages and stages uh, that were de derived from this large scale data uh, had been uh, had been described in this table that at the uh, age of 10 years pre puberty is started, but at the age of 11 years, uh, significant and clear um, signs of puberty are evident in boys, and uh, from 12 to 14 years, mid puberty period is uh, evident, um, but on the age of 14 years, um, full flash puberty. Uh, is uh, evident in boys. 15 to 17 years of uh, age is based on the late puberty um, uh, scenario and uh, at the age of 18 uh, a boy achieved almost all the uh, puberty uh, signs uh, with, uh, on the full peak. The, uh, the second phase was uh, um, uh, was running uh, simultaneously that was the development of psychosocial vulnerability scale for boys and uh, we followed the conventional uh, and uh, recommended system uh, process of uh, uh, construction of the scale and uh, here, we, um, here we collected 91 item pool and uh, the scale uh, content validity uh, was assessed with the help of uh, eight uh, uh, experts and uh, we found 0.87 um, scale content validity that is acceptable and uh, was supported through with the literature. In study 2, there were again uh, two phases. The first phase was establishment of psychometric properties of psychosocial vulnerability scale for boys and we did not have uh, an adapted or uh, indigenous scale of uh, psychological well-being for boys so we had to adapt uh, a scale uh, for the adolescents. In the first phase, uh, we uh, have we collected 506 um, uh, adolescent boys from cross-sectional research design and convenient sampling. Uh, the age range was uh, 14 to 18 years because, uh, because we took the age range of 14 years where the maximum um, puberty signs and symptoms um, are, have been achieved by the adolescent boys and uh, the crisis uh, really st starts from that age uh, according to the uh, according to the interview uh, some structured interview we took from the school counselors and child clinical psychologists exploratory factor analysis derived four factor solution that were already uh, mentioned in uh, the theoretical framework i was following and uh, significant intercorrelation was found in all these four factors that was 0.50 to 0.68. She is working further on her publications and uh, a project which has recently been given to her uh, from Monash University uh, in result of her exceptionally talented research she has been doing. Right? So, sorry. This is Nadir Shabir. I am doing my PhD under the supervision of Professor Dr. Amna Morsam. Currently, I am doing my research fellowship from Monash University, Australia under the supervision of Professor Sean Popper. I extend my sincere thanks to the symposium organizers, especially Professor Dr. Amna Morsam and the management of Lahore College for Women University, Lahore. 
organizing this symposium that fostered intellectual exchange and collaboration. Today, the topic of my presentation is Impact of Leaders' Integrity and Organizational Transparency on Employee Engagement, Exploring the Mediating Role of Psychological Empowerment in Workplaces. Introduction. So these are basically four variables, leaders' integrity, organization, transparency, psychological empowerment, and employee engagement. Theoretical framework. According to social exchange theory, when employees perceive leaders and organizations as transparent and showing concern for their empowerment, employees feel obliged to reciprocate that enhance employee engagement. The employees or subordinates of leaders or managers. So here the word employees or subordinates are the same thing. It depends on the organizations or the countries. In some places, the organization use the word employees and some places they use the word subordinates. Same as the leaders, managers, supervisors and the boss. In some organizations they use the word leader, in some organizations they use the word manager, supervisors and the boss. So basically we are talking about the immediate boss and the employees. The employees of leaders with integrity are likely to perceive themselves as being in social exchange relationships with their leaders because of the trust they feel in their leaders. Building on these ideas, Law 2006 suggested that transparency in leaders and organizations provoke feelings of trust and fairness in their employees and create an organizational environment where employees are more likely to reciprocate with beneficial organizational behavior it enhance psychological empowerment in employees. Objectives of the study to develop an indigenous perceived leaders' integrity scale with psychometric properties, to determine the impact of perceived leaders' integrity and organizational transparency on psychological empowerment and employees' engagement in organizations, to establish whether psychological empowerment has been a role on leaders' integrity and organizational transparency with employee engagement in organizations. To investigate how a leader's integrity impact employees' engagement and psychological empowerment in organizations so that some steps should be taken to improve the leader's integrity in organizations. Rationale of the study Leader's integrity is associated with positive outcomes, yet it remains unexplored in leadership studies. Recognizing this gap, there is there was a crucial need to develop a skill to assess subordinates perceptions of leaders integrity in organizational settings. This skill can serve as a value feedback tool for leader development applications methodology. The current study was comprises of three studies. Study 1 was development of indigenous perceived leaders integrity scale. Study 2 was establishing psychometric properties of the scale. And study 3 was mediating role of psychological power between these variables. Methodology study 1. So basically the study 1 was development of indigenous perceived leaders integrity scale. So it was comprises of four steps. Step one was item generation, then empirical validation, then pilot study, and then factor analysis of indigenous perceived leaders integrity scale. Methodology study two. Study two was establishing psychometric properties of the scale. So we analyze the convergent and discriminant validity of two scales with the indigenous perceived leaders integrity scale. So we will discuss further. Methodology study 3. So the research design which was used was ex post facto research design. Sample was collected from two countries, Pakistan and Australia. From Pakistan, the employees which was working under the supervision of bureaucracy was collect selected. And from Australia, the employees working in the public and private sector organizations were selected. Age range was 20 to 60 years. Sampling technique was used to the sampling technique. Results highlights of study 1. 
So this is the final factor model of indigenous perceived little integrity scale. It comprises of five subscales and it consists of 35 items. This table shows the intercorrelation matrix, mean standard deviation and Cronbach alpha of five factors of indigenous perceived little integrity scale. So the table shows the mean standard deviation and the correlation values. The Cronbach alpha value of ethical behavior is 0.963. Immoral behavior is 0.889, unethical conduct is 0.924, which is the highest value in all the four factor, five factors. Supportive behavior is 0.831 and positive attitude is 0.769. Results highlights of study 2. So this table shows the result of convergent validity. The correlation coefficient between perceived leader integrity scale and authentic leadership questionnaire. The value is 0.746 which is considered so good. The second table shows the value of discriminant validity which is correlation coefficient between perceived leader integrity scale and nepotism scale. The value is minus 0.386 which is also considered so good. Results highlights of study 3. It is concluded that perceived leader integrity is significantly correlated with all its dimensions organization transparency and all its dimensions, psychological empowerment and all its dimensions, and employee engagement and all its dimensions. It is also determined that psychological empowerment fully mediates the relationship between perceived leader integrity, organization transparency and employee engagement in employees. Perceived leader integrity and organization transparency enhance employee engagement by fostering psychological empowerment. So this is the standardized part model of Pakistani participants. The number of participants were 1006. That was the employees which are working under the supervision of bureaucrats. And the model shows the level of mediation of psychological empowerment with other variables. And this model shows the data of Australian employees. The number of participants was 763. And it also shows the level of mediation of psychological empowerment with other variables. Implications of the study. Leadership training for integrity. Recognizing the impact of leaders' integrity on employee psychological empowerment, we suggest organizations should invest in leadership training program emphasizing ethical conduct. This strategic focus can foster our transparent environment, ultimately enhancing employee engagement. Abandoning ethics in roles. To promote integrity, organizations can make ethical behavior a formal job requirement by linking it to rewards or consequences. This approach instills a sense of obligation, boosting psychological empowerment and overall engagement in the workplace. Innovative contribution. Our mediated approach introduced a novel perspective to industrial organizational psychology, offering valuable insight for future research and practical implications. Recommendations. In today's business landscapes, organizations should prioritize transparent environment and ethical leadership. For supervisors, empowering employees is crucial. It's recommended that organizations implement interventions to boost employee psychological empowerment, creating engaging workspaces. Supervisors or managers play a vital role in fostering meaningful work environment where employees feel they can make an impact. They should also focus on enhancing employee competencies. Additionally, creating supportive work climate involves considering employee perspective, offering choices, and encouraging self-initiation. This approach not only empowers employees, but also aligns with effective leadership practices. Limitations. Although this study offers valuable insight into the consequences of organizational psychology, some limitations must be considered to provide information on how future studies can be improved and extended. Multiple data sources could be considered in future studies such as leader 
self assessments to their integrity and leadership on ethics and peer ratings future studies could explore other mediating and moderating variables that is integrity related personality traits ethical climate and organizational justice to clarify the neurological network that may influence ethical leadership and work engagement a notable limitation pertains to the selectivity of the studied population in pakistan and australia the absence of a comparative analysis owing to demographic variances to improve future studies it suggested to include a wider range of participants from various sectors like academia banking and health etc both in public and private organizations this way we can make a better and more complete picture of how things work in the business world work overall other references Thank you all for your attention and participation in this meaningful symposium. Assalamu alaikum. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Aisha Shahama. So before I start my presentation, I have a question for everybody. How many of you here have mental health? Can I see a raise of hand? Who's got mental health? Uh, is it bad or good? <laughs> <laughs> it's a no. No, 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 no. It's about, I didn't ask whether you have a mental health diagnosis or not. The question that I asked was whether you have mental health, which we all do. No, 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 no. What I'm trying to highlight is whenever the term mental health is being um, stated, there's a negative connotation to it. So the question I didn't, I didn't ask whether you have a mental health diagnosis. I asked whether you have mental health. Which we all do, like physical health, we do have mental health. So that's where my research comes from, which is um, understanding mental health stigma around South Asian population. And I come from Maldives, which is also a South Asian country. So my, I'm, a, I'm on my third year now, I'm starting my third year of my PhD. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting two of my empirical studies, which are still going on. Um, so my PhD aim is understanding the concept of stigma as it applies to South Asian population. So in each, uh, I've got a study one, which will inform me of the attitudes, the beliefs, uh, which are existing in South Asian population. And I'm also including a systematic literature review of what, are, what, what, are, what is literature saying about the existing attitudes or beliefs and action in South Asian population. And then a second part of my PhD is, uh, again, reviewing literature about interventions which has been done to challenge stigma. Because the end goal of my PhD is to tailor a culturally sensitive um, intervention to challenge stigma. Because a lot of South Asian um, mental health stigma comes from, <laughs> comes from uh, religion and culture. Um, uh, just a trigger warning, yeah, I might discuss um, certain uh, yeah, triggering topics, but probably I'll be kicked out from the podium before that. <laughs> so study one is about surveying public about stigmatizing attitude, beliefs, and action about mental health. So this was an online survey uh, which, where I had about 246 female and 110 male participants. Um, what I had were uh, a vignette. So a vignette is a short story uh, which describes um, the life of Sally. And then I had the attributional questionnaire of Corrigan, and then I used as the self-esteem questionnaire. And from the participants, 66 had a formal diagnosis, and 290 said they do not have a formal diagnosis. But are we sure? Do you think they would have been truthful enough? Even though it's an online survey question, the, the, the question rises. And for my study one, uh, this is still ongoing. Uh, mind you, the, the survey, does the analysis which has been done in the presentation is from up until October this year. So I've got 144 Maldivian participants and 164 Indian participants, 25 Bangladeshi, 12 Nepalese. Um, Dr. Uh, you asked me to check yesterday how many I've got in Pakistan. So I've got about 120 extra. Um, participants from Pakistan. So this trip has been really fruitful. Um, so as you can see, the 
personal PRB's personal responsibility belief and pity help though in those subscale female has mm, sorry pity anger fear whoops I can't see no, sorry sorry oh CS. oh CS is congr uh, quotation segregation so in the negative ones which are like pity uh, sorry anger fear you can see the male has higher score than females and when you check in the no, like a positive ones like helping or pity females has more scores um, and then I did a median split on the self-esteem median split is you kind of have the range of the scores you get and then you split it in half um, so a lower self-esteem score uh, for majority of the people which was about from the scores from 10 to 28 and high was from 29 to 40 so however when you check like with people who has a diagnosis and who does not have a diagnosis it falls under the lower self-esteem so there's not much of a difference in terms of whether they have a diagnosis or whether they do not have a diagnosis in terms of self-esteem so study two I interviewed people with a mental health diagnosis over zoom hence the laptop <laughs> um, so I really would like to give a huge shout out to Mirinal Gokhale um, she's done two books on South Asian mental health she's included first-person accounts um, real life stories of South Asians living in US so she's kind of my snowflake who helped me find um, participants for my research um, yeah so far I've interviewed 15 11 female four males and majority of them are based in US and some of them are psychology students um, some of them are mental health advocates and some have podcasts maybe that's a side effect of lockdown I think having a podcast uh, so from interviews, I used an already uh, published uh, structured interview. So the authors were kind enough to send me their interview schedule. So I used it. Um, I adapted my interview questions through that. And I asked about their diagnoses. What was the understanding of their diagnoses? What changes they noticed after their diagnoses? And what stigma meant to them? And what sort of stigma they um, experienced, whether it work or whether it's cool? and about the treatment, whether they felt any tre uh, treatment stigma, uh, what were their reaction, the, the reactions when they disclosed about their mental health diagnosis. So some common experiences were misdiagnosis. Okay, one, two misdiagnosis is one thing, but when you have six, eight misdiagnoses, you <laughs> kind of will feel like, am I, the, <laughs> am I the person in wrong or is the person who is diagnosing in me in wrong? Uh, so there were cases of um, labeling, trauma, sexual abuse, pressure, family issues, stigma by association, which means if you are working with somebody, uh, say most of you are like in psychology field, practitioners, so that's one thing that is associated if you work in a field of psychology or if you're a therapist or if you're a caretaker of a person who has a mental health diagnosis. Uh, they described uh, their suicide attempts, uh, the, the conflicts that they had with their mental practitioners. So I'll skip this because I'll come to more. Uh, so these were one of two of my participants who are two psychology students. Um, so one is a female, one is a male. Uh, female often has a diagnosis of PMDD and dad had a diagnosis of schizophrenia and the male had a diagnosis of depression and he is a psychotherapist in training so what do you think about these two students do you think they might have a, had a good experience in terms of their mental health uh, diagnosis or in terms of the stigma they experienced is it a, what, what's your guess being a psychology student being a psychotherapist in training having a history of uh, mental health in the family. Do you think they're going to have a good experience or bad experience? Bad. Bad? Bad. bad? Yeah. Which one of them is going to have a bad experience? Both of them? One of them? Right? right. right. Boy? Um, no. Go. So the female? No. So this is ex except from the, the FNN. Um, so 
her dad was called Pagel, crazy, and they were called a maid person's daughter. Her and her sister were called that. And um, they had really low awareness of mental health in the family. They avoided him, they treated him differently. So they had to move to a different city for treatment. And then they blamed, they, the family blamed her mom, uh, is the person who made, made their father mad, and the effect of shaitan, basically possession, uh, was there kind of uh, saying that that's the reason why he had his mental illness. So, so he, I asked her, like, since their whole extended family knows about her dad, was she comfortable sharing her mental health diagnosis? And she was like, no, none of my, none apart from my mother knows. Uh, it's again because of the stigma. And this is, a, this is something that her mom said to her. My mom is like, dad already had a mental disorder. Why do you want another diagnosis for yourself? Isn't it enough that you faced all these things from dad? Now you have to do this. So no, she really didn't have a supportive um, environment in terms of that, even though she's a psychology student, even though her dad had a mental health um, diagnosis, and even though he was getting treatment for it, she didn't have the same experience. Uh, so this is uh, another two participants who's a parent, a psychiatrist. What do we think here? So a female diagnosis is of OCD, male diagnosis of uh, bipolar. What's your pick? Who's your pick? Both good, both bad. Should be good. No, not good. This is a, no, this is about the experience. Experience. Um, so you would think having a parent as a psychiatrist would mean they'll have a better insight of your diagnosis. They're going to be better supportive to you with your daily life. But that's not the case. The female, she had good um, experience. Uh, she had uh, three, four generations of, uh, in her family who had OCD. So they really had the understanding and awareness. So she had a good experience. She didn't, she didn't experience stigma. But the male with bipolar diagnosis, his top talking for his father after his diagnosis. And he was disruptive, he was um, going through a divorce, uh, and when he had the first diag when he met the, um, a, a, a psychiatrist, it was during his depression cycle, and the therapist gave him um, antidepressants without a mood stabilizer. So if you're here a clinical psychologist or psychiatrist, you know how um, disruptive it's going to be. So kind of the, the psychiatrist enabled his mania because uh, when he took the antidepressants, yes, he was okay, he was feeling fine, but no, that was his mania phase. It was not him coming out of a depression because he's bipolar. So this is again, um, somehow except from his interview. My father, who is an actually psychiatrist, actually put me on antidepressant with, you know, without a mood stabilizer. So as you, I'm sure, know that actually was very dangerous and it kick-started a manic episode. Uh, so I asked, like, wouldn't you think your dad would have better insight of your behavior? And he's like, the last thing you want to do when you come home is that think of it, you know, it exists under your roof. And I think, I just think that it was very hard for him to see objectively. So that was it. And, and after like years after his diagnosis, they stopped, they, they cut ties. An email that his father sent to his wife, it read like, you know, there's no genetic history of a mental illness in our family. He's still ignorant. He's still kind of dissociating himself, like detaching himself to, um, his child, basically. So some positive points that I identified uh, through the interviews were they were training uh, or you know, studying psychology. They're creating awareness. They're advocating for mental health. 
and they actively participate in the community to have activities regarding mental health and mental awareness. Yeah. Thank you. So this is still an ongoing survey. So this QR code will kind of have my um, survey link and a poster. So if you want to take a picture, you can fill it, you can pass it along. I think disclaimer is that some um, university Wi-Fi might not allow you to go to the survey link. So you might want to use uh, your <laughs> Wi-Fi or data. Thank you. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you so much. Now I would like to welcome uh, Ms. Annett Lewis Dawson from University of Bolton, UK. If you want to come from that side, you can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to take everybody away from um, psychology, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, accounting for digital currency in the modern economy. I'm an accountant by trade. Um, I've been an accountant for 20 years now and uh, decided to go back to university to get my chartered accountancy. Um, so digital currency is a big thing. It's been going now for about 30 years and has been evolving and evolving and to a point now where, where accountants like ourselves are finding it difficult to look to um, work out how to account for digital currency within corporations. Um, so first of all, we need to, as, as accountants, we need to understand um, digital currency in all of its forms. There's approximately 6,000 types of digital currency on the, on the market at the moment. So you can imagine all of this virtual currency running around the ether. Um, so it's broken down into three sections. You've got cryptocurrency, which we all know as Bitcoin. Um, now, cri cryptocurrency is on what's called a blockchain. And that blockchain is um, what would go into your crypto wallet if you, if you invested in cryptocurrency. Virtual currency is very similar to our credit cards. You know, when we're doing the tippy-tappy, when we're buying, uh, buying our goods, um, anything like that, or you're buying through PayPal, Again, that's another form of virtual currency. And then we've got central bank di di digital currency. Every country has a central bank. And every central, well, not every central bank, most central banks throughout the world are in the process of either issuing their own digital currency, like China, um, the sand dollar in, in the Bahamas, um, or they're researching and developing their own, their own digital currency. Um, I believe in Pakistan, it's actually banned at the moment and it's not on their radar, which is a, there's a possibility there from a, polit a political point of view that they're going to be behind if, uh, if all of these banks, banking institutions release their digital currency, which, is going to, which might stop any cross-border trading there. So the advantages of dig digital currency. Thank you, Darlene. You're so good. <laughs> First and foremost, it's efficiency and speed. From business to business or peer to peer, if you're, um, if you're trading with a digital currency, it's straight away, it's immediate. Um, and the global accessibility, if you've got a digital currency, um, so if the banks do issue their own digital currencies, or if there are, um, you're trading in digital currency, the global accessibility and cross-border trading is immediate. There's no, um, there's no foreign, foreign currency exchange, there's no banks, there's no middleman. Um, which means everything goes so much quicker and it's easier, even for ourselves. If we want to be able to purchase something, we don't have to worry about what's the foreign exchange, how much, how much are we losing. So for the UK, we're in, a, we're in quite a good position because more often than not, we get a gain on, on what we purchase if we're going to sell it on. Um, for, for, more, um, for countries that are not as developed, or even with Europe, because they're, they're not as strong as the, as the pound, they'll actually lose a little bit. So you've got this up and, up and down. And then um, security and transparency. So because, of the, because it's going through, um, through the internet, it's more secure. It's built on a blockchain. It's, it's, it, fair enough, it's not regularized, regulated at the minute, but that's where we're going to wear accountants and, uh, and, as, and um, the regulatory bodies come in and transparency, you know where it's going, you can see it, you can see on your bank statements, you can see the piece of paper, you know where your money's going. 
Thank you. So the challenge is, um, like I said, for accountants like myself, it is challenging when it comes to digital currency. There's so many out there. They all work on different platforms. Some are used for investment. Some are used for trading. Um, some are used for the, for the black market. Um, so we need to, uh, and, and the problem is, is the lack of regu uh, regular, re regulatory framework. At the moment, uh, the IFRS, which is um, the international regulatory body, um, says that we to use uh, two different IFRSs, which don't completely work with digital currency, which means that we're not actually, even though we're accounting for it, it's not accounted for properly. And then you've got the valuation challenges. With um, digital currency, it's so volatile. So one day it can be worth a pound, another day it'll be worth a million. And you see the people like Elon Musk uh, with Tesla and Samsung making lots of money in, in, uh, in investing in digital currency and us little people losing it. <laughs> um, so because of the complexity of, of the valuation at the moment, we're to value it on its um, fair value measurement, um, which is going into um, accountancy jargon. Um, but because of that, it's very hard for us to be able to, um, to work out exactly how much your um, digital wallet is worth. So um, the current practices, as I said, is recognition and, and measurement at the moment. It's, a, it's an intangible asset with a fair value um, at the time of acquisition. And then disclosure requirements. What they're saying at the moment um, is that we should disclose um, the nature of the digital currency held and um, how it's operated and the financial risks associated with it. So that's putting notes into the financial reports. It's a lot of information to put in there. Thank you. So future trends in accounting and um, standardization practices, which is where I, where I want this to be able to go. I want to design my own IFRS that will be completely um, suitable for digital currency accounting. And it's integration into financial statements rather than it being, um, rather than being accounted for as, um, a, as an intangible asset, which means it's just there as an investment to have its own line item as a digital currency and what type of digital currency it is. So, um, as I've said, accounting practices, um, I want, it's a new and evolving field. I want to be able to make, make, the, make accounting for it better. And um, financial industry, the impact of digital currency in the financial industry promises to be significant. So it's, it's here, it's coming, it's gonna take us forward in, in, in trade. Thank you. Is that it? Yes! Thank you so much, Nettie. <laughs> uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Isha Umar with us from University of Bolton, UK. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, I forgot what I had to say. Assalamu alaikum everyone. This is my master's dissertation that I will be presenting in front of you guys um, today. Also, uh, I, this, this presentation is supposed to be five minutes long, so I'm going to try my best to skim through this presentation so I can present this to you in uh, the best way that I can. Um, also, um, also, um, I'm really sorry if some of the contents of this um, presentation might feel uncomfortable to most of you people. Um, please excuse me if this triggers some feelings in you all, but this is my entire truth. And um, this is my entire truth, and um, I, I feel like um, this needs to be, I guess, um, spoken about, and a conversation needs to be started about this. Um, next. <laughs> So um, uh, basically, um, through my research, I put focus on uh, goal five of the United Nations SDG um, agenda to achieve gender equality and empowerment for all girls. Um, so therefore, I foreground my um, humanistic, feminist, and gender transformative values in the plight that all women are, uh, can be considered as equal um, to others, can take themselves seriously as well as be taken seriously amongst the rest. Next. 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 
next four times next <coughs> next piche so in this story the um, author traverses the scope of the gender norms and stereotypical roles prevalent in her shared culture that marginalize women by inducing feelings of guilt and shame and this takes into account the wider personal and social political context um, that contributes to the author's feelings of guilt and shame as well as her distress um through habits such as people pleasing codependency and a kind of enmeshment within the family dynamics that are prevalent in her shared culture such as that of pakistan from which the author hails from so to the entirety of the story the author is me myself and i next So through this autoethnographic account I used my personal narrative and lived experiences to investigate the phenomena in question while the research serves as a call for more mental health academics counselors and professionals working in the field to engage with their first hand stories around their own personal difficulties and suffering next next So I as the author become the researcher and the subject through the entirety of the study and use my own personal influence to affect the findings of the research rather than staying away from such matters therefore I follow an evocative narrative that allows the researcher to de uh, decontextualize her trauma over a significant period of time in order to demonstrate to others how to cope in an uncertain world and how to move forward So I use fictional devices and short stories to narrate my experiences from her uh, from my childhood and the abuse um, that the author experienced at the hands of a caregiver. I use fictional devices and short stories to circumvent some of the ethical concerns that would otherwise arise by identifying and examining uh, examining my uh, participants explicit role in the abuse. Next. Peach Okay. Okay. So this autoethnographic account also recounts the story of the author's late friend who died in the April of 2012 when the author was just 19 years old and this was due to a tragic case of drug abuse. The author remembers clear instances after her friend's death where she was approached by um her friend's mother and was instructed to wipe off um short stories and grief journals that she um would write on public forums for the de uh, for the dead next so the point that i'm trying to make here is that i uh, this interfered with my active engagement on my grief journey as well as being unable to existentially move my life forward through my writings and representations of him next um my parents were also not uh, were also adamant to not grant me my last wish which was to attend my um uh, friend's funeral uh, amongst his family and friends as well as be able to attend with his burial service um as well as to be able to uh, help with his burial service my mother and father also said that they heard voices from people such as she murdered their son what a disgraceful girl she probably put him on the drugs um he overdosed because of the stress they used to have so many arguments she ought to have a criminal fi uh, case filed against her next so this um and even though like i just want to add that even though my parents were right in the decisions that they made for me and i i'm completely aware of the fact that they had my best interests in heart and i'm not trying to blame them for anything um the point that i'm trying to make here is that uh, events did affect me in a certain way and led me to feeling severely depressed so this led to a focus on themes of emotional loneliness and dissonance dissonance that comes with the dependence on avoidance and being unable to integrate the loss of a loved one next this research consequently uh, consequentially proposes a combination of person centered and cbt grief interventions that direct survivors of bereavement towards more self compassion and self care and help them cope with shame adaptively next also i write about my incident of abuse in a relationship in the summer of 2022 which was last year this led me to leave and flee the country and pursue my masters in counseling and positive psychology at the university of bolton next 
It is suggested that shame implies a feeling of being judged or exposed by an imagined or public audience uh, with a typical wish by an experiencing person to lose their status or simply disappear or hide. Um, through my initial days at the University of Bolton, every time I would walk through a crowd full of students and people, um, I felt like everybody w was just staring at me and punishing me for how dirty I was. And this I kind of translates back to my incident of abuse, I feel, where the other party started it off with a lot of verbal insults, and it got to a point where he started ultimately hitting me. Um, so drawing on the works of Saeed and Foucault, this critical analysis studies the uh, repression and representation of women as the other in a collectivist and patriarchal socio-cultural milieu, powered by language and discourse, along with the effort to shift the debate towards the inclusion of more diversity and minority voices within the society. Next. This research also explores the use of power and language to control, dominate, and stigmatize the other, which can be associated with the cognitive form of miserliness that is cruel. Next. So through the second half of my dissertation, I speak about positive psychology concepts such as resilience and optimism and how I used them hand in hand as adaptive personality traits and attributional styles that reflected upon my well-being, my subjective um, happiness and life satisfaction levels, as well as my challenges uh, with stress at my university, um, as well as how that uh, positively affected and enhanced my self-esteem, my academic engagement, as well as the forming and maintaining of good and positive relationships. Um, traumatic experiences provide individuals with an opportunity to grow psychologically through the experience of emotions, um, relationships, finding purpose and meaning in life. I find purpose and meaning in life every day by helping my clients in a counseling room, um, in my counseling sessions with them. Um, I get to make a little difference in their lives every day and I feel like this is a very rewarding thing for me to do. Um, my uh, line of work and career has also helped me establish a new self-identity for myself, which I'm extremely happy and um, proud of. And it has significantly given me a sense of accomplishment and personal achievement that I am very happy with and I couldn't be more proud of myself most times. Next. 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 So I developed strengths such as gratitude, kindness, and hope that are occurrences and components of post-traumatic growth. I learned to be grateful I'm grateful to be presenting in front of you all at the, as part of the UK Park Mobility Grant. I'm also grateful to God to be standing alive to this day. I'm grateful for all the mental health support and advice I was able to gain from the Life Lounge all year long at the University of Bolton. Um, I'm also, I, I also learned to be self-compassionate because how could I be um, kind towards others if I didn't know how to show empathy to myself. I also learned to be hopeful. It is said that if a, if a mind can learn to be hopeless, it can also be learned to be hopeful. And I also learned to forgive myself for every time I thought I failed um, at an unrealistic expectation or standard that I had possibly set off myself. Um, so lastly, uh, I propose a trauma-informed uh, approach um, that integrates the need for trauma within collectivist cultures and also um, uh, a, significant, a significant need of uh, research within modalities such as um, e, uh, EMDR, IFS, internal family system, sensory motor therapy, etc. to accommodate the needs of different cultural and marginalized groups ex existing in the UK's social cultural setup. I also explore cases of trauma and abuse where clients have dissociated themselves Result resultantly, this helps in the understanding of extreme cases of dissociation and uh, dissociative identity disorder and symptoms of CPTSD, which are still not widely recognized or not included in the DSM-5. Next. Um, lastly, I focus on person-centered therapy and the humanistic approach in line with positive psychology concepts such as hope, optimism, resilience, <laughs> post-traumatic growth um, uh, to help facilitate the actualizing tendency of different subgroups and marginalized individuals in the UK, as well as foster their resilience levels and help them find new and effective ways of 
coping to build on the resilience levels and just help them uh, find um, good regulation strategies for themselves. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isha. And I must say that uh, I think I can say this on behalf of everyone that it is very difficult to share your own experience, let alone uh, work on them and then share uh, other insights. So my best wishes and prayers are your way. And you are a really strong person, I would say. Uh, I would request uh, Professor Dr. Uzma Qureshi to provide the concluding remarks for the session. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and very good afternoon to everyone. Well, this has been a very interesting experience for me as a researcher and, so, and a, as an educator because I also teach the teachers and uh, picking up some of the patterns from the research which has been just shared with us I'm sure will be very useful uh, if we further sort of develop it. What I have picked up from this session is that we can come from diverse researchers look at different phenomena from diverse sort of lenses. And uh, it is the connection between the research, especially the last one where the, um, uh, Isha has shared her auto-ethnographic account-based uh, research, if I may call it. Um, it's very useful for us to listen to a story like that. Uh, we are also conducting a research uh, on women, women who work uh, in education sector um, in the rural areas of Pakistan. And there, again, we are picking up their personal accounts and trying to understand exactly their experience. Uh, as we all know, especially people who uh, engage in uh, qualitative research, that there are no neat answers as such. Um, the phenomena that we... Uh, or, uh, sort of um, try to explore has multi-dimensional uh, kind of makeup, if you like. So trying to look at a phenomena which you're not directly related to and with the lens which the other person has picked up and shown to you is a very important exercise for all research, especially I think the psychology people must be benefiting from it because uh, uh, when I was listening to Natty, uh, Ms. Dawson, um, she was talking about digital accounting, digital economy, and from local to global economy and all of that. As an educator, I was just trying to understand exactly where was there a path for me to pick up from this methodology to approach, to look at something which is some uh, digitalization is something very common. We are working on artificial intelligence in education and everything. So connecting different, plugging in with one another as researchers is something I should commend you, Dr. Saiba, to have this kind of engagement between the researchers from UK and researchers from Pakistan. Unless we don't plug in like that and plug off, unplug, and replug, we cannot really be good researchers. So in psychology, you can pick up ideas, looking at the taboos which have been discussed, we sometimes find it very difficult to accept the mental health issues. We all have mental health, but we have, some, we have issues as well. It's just because they become issues when we do not address them. And there is such a taboo attached to that, especially in South Asia. You've done, I, I've, been, I've lived in UK for more than 10 years, and as a researcher, I have worked with uh, uh, quite a few groups, uh, and I have uh, uh, related with that, being a Pakistani going from Pakistan to England, that these taboos are generation, are, uh, have roots in generations and generations of people. And we do not, we are unable to disconnect because uh, there is a fear of losing yourself as an individual and losing your identity. And unless we do not engage in a research like that, I don't think we can get anywhere uh, uh, as researchers and people who are trying to find solutions to social and other uh, problems that we sort of bring out in our fields. So thank you so much for this uh, inv invite. Uh, I'm not a psychology person, but I've learned a lot during the sessions. Um, and I'm going to request you to, uh, if there is a possibility of them having a meeting with our PhD students, uh, your PhD students and our PhD students, so that we sort of uh, 
sort of uh, pick up the threads that are relevant and tie them up to come up with a pattern which would uh, help us um, chisel out uh, research in our specific areas of study. So thank you so much. Uh, congratulations for the brilliant research you're all engaged in. And um, once again, um, congratulations to psychology department. I've always believed in Dr. Um, Amna Mozum, her leadership and her potential to move forward and do things and think out of the box to come up with brilliant uh, solutions uh, and uh, pathways for the research. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Osma. Now we are heading towards the concluding ceremony of the session. And uh, I invite Dr. Amina Mozam uh, to address us as the concluding remarks. And uh, she is also uh, <laughs> a co-project lead. And uh, she will be giving us further insights into this. Thank you, Zunera. Okay, so Zunera is uh, wise enough that she uh, invited me once for both things, for conclusion of the session and for beginning of the concluding ceremony. So thank you for being so wise. So um, I think it has been the all day that we have been talking about different research projects and initiatives which has been taken by different researchers related to psychology department. So first I would like to give brief comments an appreciation to our international students, and then we will be formally heading towards the conclusion ceremony. So first of all, my heartfelt call, congratulations to three of you for presenting your work here. It was amazing, and it was fabulous to listen to all three of you um, in your different areas. I think uh, the, the work which you have been talking about, the mental health stigma, is really very, very important to um, to speak about as much as we all can because mental health is a continuum. Someone was asking that are we the part of that mental health. We all are the part of that mental health. On one side of the continuum is uh, well-being and the other side of the well uh, continuum is the formal diagnosis for mental health. So each one of us is in the journey of that continuum. So a uh, fabulous study by you, uh, Shaha, and I hope that we will be able to collect some more data for you uh, as far as you have very limited number of data with you. But uh, you see that in just two days, you got so many responses and many more will be coming to you, inshallah. And uh, then a uh, very excellent presentation about accounting for digital currency by Netty. Uh, Netty has been gracious enough to listen so much psychology stuff the whole day. <laughs> Um, and I think you will finally become a mini psychologist because, <laughs> yeah. But uh, thanks to the, you know, uh, faculty members of management and, uh, um, you know, management sciences department, Dr. Adil Nasir, I welcome you. Dr. Saqib Rahman, he has given an ex exceptionally talented, uh, you know, uh, speech this morning. So because of them, you are getting the flavor of management science and business as well. So thanks to these two. And Isha, um, I must appreciate that you have presented a very fabulous work. It's not easy to present uh, your own journey, your own work, and especially these, psychology is huge. We have so many domains to present, to work on, uh, and especially talking about ethnographic research, uh, it really means something very, very important in psychology, and these kind of researches should be done more and more. So uh, thanks to all of you. And uh, keeping the liberty of uh, being the project co-PI, um, I would like to again mention, as I mentioned in this morning, but few of the eminent delegates were not here, that this uh, special PhD symposium was being, you know, in a, a set up in return of that Park UK Education Gateway Mobility Partnership for Students, um, which was being, uh, you know, uh, taken under Park UK Education Gateway Mobility Partnership. Um, it was being, uh, you know, hosted by British Council. HEC was also one of a part of it. And this was a collaboration between University of Bolton and Lahore College for Women University. So three students have been coming from, you know, University of Bolton to Pakistan, which are in front of you. This is the second and the final phase of that mobility. Initially, uh, from the first part, five students, out of them, three were from the Department of Education, madam, and two were from the Department of Psychology. 
they visited University of Bolton, but they uh, don't only visited University of Bolton, but they were uh, lucky enough to visit University of Manchester, University of Manchester Metropolitan University, uh, UCL, King's College London, and a couple of other universities as well. And, and I will mention at the end that who was the driving force behind all these, you know, visits and management and, you know, many, many other things, uh, which, uh, which takes hours and hours to share that how difficult it, was, it would be and how it was made so easy by one single person. So uh, I think it was a huge opportunity for Department of Psychology because since the inception of this department, which is, uh, this is the 75th year for this department being incepted. This is first time in the history that any student from the Department of Psychology has went to UK for seeking such kind of a mobility. So this is huge. And this is for the first time that students from United Kingdom has, you know, traveled to Pakistan and shared their work, their experiences, and so many other things formally and informally with the students of psychology department. So I think this is something uh, which is kind of an ice breaking and it is going to open up avenues for many, many more projects like this. So I think we all should first appreciate that uh, this is like, uh, you know, first step and many, many more to come forward. Yeah. So um, on this very special occasion, we have arranged this uh, plan in which after, uh, during the inaugural session, we have uh, two keynotes and uh, one motivational keynote by Dr. Saqib Rahman on leadership. And then there was one success story by Dr. Umer Ubab Kazmi. Then we have a special session on outward mobility where we were over five students who went for out, outward mobility, presented their work and uh, then technical session uh, in which students from two technical st uh, sessions, students from various, you know, um, uh, years of their PhD, like year two, three, and four, they presented their work. And then again, in this special uh, session, which was the inward mobility, uh, three international students presented their work. So it was a whole complete, very, very engaging day. And I think it went really great. So um, to, uh, at, at the, you know, Conclusion, I would like to thank a couple of the people who have been, <clears throat> you know, instrumental in, uh, <clears throat> who have been instrumental in making this uh, day a very successful one. Um, uh, there was a lot of support from, uh, you know, students who were work who, who are already enrolled in the PhD program. So I thank them all. Then the senior alumni who came all, all day, sat, sat here and, you know, they were engaged in different roles like session chairs or, you know, they are giving their expert feedback on the students' work. Then faculty of Department of Applied Psychology, State Officer Gayas Saab, Security Officer, special thanks to Department of Management Sciences. Um, both of you are sitting here. Thanks for your hospitality to students. And then the uh, IT expert, Mr. Tamur, and all of those who have been the part of, you know, this project in one way or another. Above all, I would like to mention that uh, how this uh, mobility project has been, you know, um, came in. So the main driving force behind uh, this project was uh, engineer Dr. Aksa Shabi, and I'm very, very thankful to her. Please give a very big round of applause to her because it is because of her vision that she has written that mobility grant for students and psychology department and education department were lucky enough that they were become the part of that project and uh, that's how this mobility came in. All of, uh, you know, all the people were writing for faculty mobility, but Dr. Aksa was visionary enough that she did not uh, uh, write uh, only the faculty mobility, but she wrote the student mobility and gave chances to these eight students to do these wonderful experiences and this is huge. And writing a you know, project is not an easy thing, looking at different things like, as you all know from your bookings, your travel, your, the place where you are going to stay, where the heating is not working, where you know, the door keys, uh, you know, it's, it's all about experience. From the day you sat in a plane, you book a ticket, you travel, so there's a lot and lot of you know, um, information that comes to you. So I really thank her for giving this opportunity to the students of psychology and education uh, to become the part of this mobility, and that's really transformational. And, and I also thank the project co-lead, Dr. Naveed Iqbal, 
uh, for providing you huge assistance in many ways in documenting your research in digital training of uh, gadgets and uh, keeping the record of all your journey whatever you have been doing and at the end i hope he will be providing you with a very nice film or documentary which will be you know uh, which will be retained in archives for uh, you know your travel and for the uh, travel of the student um, i would also like to thank uh, the vice chancellor professor dr shugupta uh, professor dr shugupta naz who couldn't come here she promised to be there but there is going to be another important event that is education expo uh, so she excused for this event but she has sent her best wishes for this symposium um, and um, uh, uh, i think um, that i am very humble and very grateful that professor dr uzma qureshi has taken her time out to attend i think it's about two session which you have attended in in detail and you have given feedback on them so i have already introduced in detail about the madam's expertise that how instrumental she is in bringing the change to lahore college for women university university and i'm sure that in her uh, again in her new role as uh, director faculty development in, and internationalization uh, she will be uh, going to create a lot of new changes in the university so with this thank you very much from your uh, from my side and you zanara please continue Thank you so much, Dr. Amna. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, next, we have Dr. Uh, Rushail Ramkissan uh, as a guest of honor with us, and uh, it's over a video. Uh, Alina, can you please? Uh, I think the, the video is by uh, Dr. Jerome Carson. Who plays that? With the mic. Okay. Uske yes. We couldn't hear him earlier due to yeah. the technical error, mm -hmm. so we can do it now. hard work and my young colleagues like Dr. Aksa. Uh, I didn't mention you earlier because I didn't know that you were the main, you are the PI of this project and I've also admired her right from the very first day I met her um, because she has so much potential and leadership in her um, and um, I remember when first time we spoke um, she was already so charged up to do something new in this university related to research and other areas of her interest. So I hope that this continues and I hope that other friends and students who are sitting here take up uh, this opportunity 
to engage with one another and uh, come up with more projects like this one because we do need to keep the momentum on uh, so that uh, it doesn't stop and it is not just one off uh, venture. It needs to be a sort of uh, ingrained in our institution, um, having this tradition to always um, welcome new ideas and engage in a dialogue, research dialogue, as we did today. So thank you so much, and congratulations. Uh, thank you so much once again, Professor Dr. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, this uh, symposium uh, uh, will be incomplete, because now we have uh, Dr. Aksa Shabir with us, and uh, she is the uh, PI for this uh, mobility program. So uh, we can't uh, let you go without hearing something from our side. <laughs> So uh, I'll be brief because it's not always good to be the only person between the food and uh, <laughs> and everybody. So uh, I mean, how could I not start without immensely firstly thanking Professor Dr. Uzma Qureshi. I think it's essential here to recognize when I finished my PhD and I joined back, I was still a lecturer. And I really, I owe wherever I am partly accomplished uh, all uh, due to her. Uh, and I've always, even when she was away as Vice Chancellor of Women University Multan, so in her moments of absence also, uh, I, I feel blessed that we could always recognize that and acknowledge that. And also so glad that she's here and we, uh, I think I talk on behalf of all of us that we we'll learn and uh, from her more and flourish under her. Uh, so Professor Mozam has already briefed you about the project. I'm very glad that uh, we have this, uh, we, we have several research and capacity building projects going on. Also under Park UK Education Gateway, this is a third one. We have uh, this project going on on climate change. We completed one on STEM education, but this is a very special one. Uh, and I think uh, other than the academic and research gains, uh, we've also really enjoyed the cultural uh, part of it. Uh, and uh, along with the three guests, we're also getting to see portions of Lahore and, and eating cuisines in a way that we've never eaten them. Uh, with this, our everlasting commitment reiterated again that we'll start on our weight loss goals <laughs> after they depart Pakistan. Because how can we be bad hosts and not accompany them in all the good food that they're trying? Is that is that true, Nati? Yes. yes. Yeah. And and I think I talk on behalf of our uh, girls also that they had uh, an immense time, wonderful time when they were in UK, uh, wonderful experiences. They were in Imperial College London. They were interviewed by the BBC, uh, which is uh, I think uh, a dream come true for anybody. And, and, and then there were several other experiences. There, were, there was a conference where Ms. Farah Qureshi was able to win uh, the Best Presenter uh, Award and, and several other wonderful experiences that they have. And I think uh, when we reflect back on life, it is these little moments and these little experiences that we rejoice the most. So uh, we hope uh, that you know, uh, everybody is able to maximize uh, this mobility experience. And, and gain more in the few days that Shaha, Neti, and Isha are still here. Uh, how can I not uh, you know, acknowledge the fact that Isha, what you shared with us was very, very brave. And even though we've been with you for one week, I think I have this newfound admiration and, and respect for you. It's, it's, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Uh, and uh, I would just end by thanking uh, Professor Shini Asad, uh, because uh, since Isha started uh, the, you know, the tradition where we really share our own moments, I think it was in 2011 when I first met her. And then there's uh, a lot of mentoring that I received from her. Uh, and uh, now that I, my eyes fall on Dr. Sakev, I think Dr. Amna was looking for a, a very uh, you know, wonderful speaker. So I suggested how you really don't need to look outside when we have Dr. Sakev to teach leadership to everybody in this university. And then she tells me that my recommendation was 100% correct. Yes. yes. So um, I think we'll now move to uh, Zunera. Yes, so yes. we have souvenir distribution yes. now. Yeah. So I'm making sure there's a souvenir distribution so that they don't, they don't blame me that <laughs> there were more speakers before they could eat. So now uh, is the time for souvenir distribution uh, because you have taken out your precious time and uh, all these efforts so we won't be let you going empty handed. <laughs> uh, for this, uh, we'll start with, yes. Uh, we'll start with the very first inaugural session uh, and uh, for, uh, for uh, the very first, we would have uh, Professor Dr. Amna Mozum uh, and uh, Professor Dr. Uzma Qureshi.
आई थिंक वन बाय वन अच्छा देने के लिए ओके प्लीज डॉक्टर शीनियर सर प्लीज ज्वाइन अस ठीक है ओके जी सो स्टूडेंट्स फ्रॉम आउटवर्ड नेक्स्ट आई वु लाइक टू कॉल मिस इकरा आसिफ मिस इकरा आसिफ प्लीज ज्वाइन अस हेयर इकरा आसिफ क्या करिए वो लंच के इंतजाम देखिए नेक्स्ट वी हैव अलीना खान अगेन स्टूडिंग फ्रॉम आउटिंग Now we will be presenting souvenirs for the inward mobility, and I would like to call Miss Aisha Shahama. Miss Annette Lewis Dawson. नेक्स्ट वी हैव ईशा उमर नेक्स्ट अब आप ले आओ उनको तो नहीं देने सर्टिफिकेट हाँ सर्टिफिकेट देने ठीक है मरियम अमजद नाज शबीर नहीं ये दोनों क्यों नहीं है मरियम नेक्स्ट वी वुड लाइक टू कॉल आर पीएचडी स्कॉलर नुजतुल नैन इफ वी हैव हर विद अस और एल्स वी कैन सेव इट ओके ओके हाँ आई थिंक डॉक्टर में जो आदमी जो सबसे स्टोरी है कि वो नहीं है सर्टिफिकेट को किसी नहीं बनी ना जो सर्टिफिकेट ठीक है ओके नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू कॉल डॉक्टर उम्मीर उबाब काजमी दिस इज द सर्टिफिकेट इसके बाद हमारे पास सारा शाहिद सुबह वाले वो है नहीं हमारे पास ना शीनिया सर नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू कॉल डॉक्टर साकिब रहमान डॉक्टर कोई भी शील्ड और सर्टिफिकेट पकड़ा दें भाई दे 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 कोई पकड़ा दो यार जल्दी से दे दो ना इतनी देर नहीं लगानी भाई अब नेक्स्ट टाइम नेक्स्ट शीनियर सर ठीक है कुछ मकर नहीं देता नहीं देता नेक्स्ट वी है डॉक्टर नहीं दता बहुत साफी करिए डॉक्टर नहीं दता
डॉक्टर अदील ठहर के आपको बुलाना है रुक जाए डॉक्टर अदील नासिर फॉर इज इमेन सपोर्ट ओके ये तो नहीं मार कोई बात नहीं ठीक है नो डॉक्टर अदील नासिर डॉक्टर अदील नासिर नहीं उनको मिल रही ना अभी वो भी तो बॉक्स पहुंचा है अभी ये भी पहुंचा है उसपे तो ढूंढे कैसे हैं वी हैव ये मिल गई मिल गई अच्छा सॉरी थैंक यू जी नेक्स्ट वी हैव डॉक्टर नाइमा हसन प्लीज ज्वाइन अस इसके बाद डॉक्टर अफसर शबीर तब तक डॉक्टर उसमें कुरैशी आ जाएंगे फिर उनके ठीक है डॉक्टर नवीद अकबाल नहीं है हम कहाँ हैं डॉक्टर नवीद अकबाल कहाँ हैं हमारे अच्छा जी नेक्स्ट वी हैव डॉक्टर अक्सर शबीर डॉक्टर नवीद अकबाल प्लीज ज्वाइन अस हेयर डॉक्टर नवीद आ गए इसके बाद डॉक्टर आमना मोजी हाँ तुम करते हैं ना तो सही है बड़े कमाल के हैं इस प्रोडक्ट के अंदर माशाल्लाह तुम तुम भी सीख रहे हैं इनसे भी डॉक्टर आमना मोजी थैंक यू डॉक्टर नदी थैंक यू वेरी मच अच्छा आई रिक्वेस्ट नेक्स्ट वी हैव डॉक्टर आमना मोजी डॉक्टर आमना मोजी नेक्स्ट मिस मुबीना है आप पहले पहले मुबीना थैंक यू वेरी मच जी जी मिस मुबीना नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू कॉल मिस मुबीना मुनीर मुबीना आप तो आ जाएं अपना सर्टिफिकेट भी दिए क्या ओके जी ह्यूज एप्रिशिएशन गोस टू मुबीना फॉर डूइंग लॉट ऑफ वर्क फॉर दिस डॉक्टर उसमें कुछ डॉक्टर उसमें कुछ रेशिक डॉक्टर उसमें कुछ रेशिक एंड यू चाइन Please join us here. We have token of appreciation for you. Okay. Okay. Do not ask. How can I call myself? Somebody else should announce your name. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. Thank you so much. So I will request all the alumni, PhD, graduates. Uh, if you all can come up and have a group photo. Yes. I think. Bahir mein. Chalein. Kya hum bahir kya karte? Ye hamare team hai. I think jo rehenge. Masoor kuch hai. Doctor Naima. Aaye na. Doctor Naima. Doctor Shamim. Doctor Naima. Doctor Umair Ubaid Kazmi. Aap hi rehte hain. Aaj. Doctor Uzma ki rehte hain abhi kabhi. Ji uske baad. Theek hai. Theek hai. Okay. Jaldi aaje. Quickly. Quickly. दे दें जल्दी से दे दें कोई से पकड़ा दे नहीं है मुझे बताना नाम ठीक है मुझे बताना नाम चलें लास्ट बट नॉट द लीस्ट अब आप मैडम को बुलाएं उनको चील दें हम I request Dr. Usma Qureshi once again to please join us here. हम आपको बहुत तंग कर रहे हैं। नहीं नहीं, you don't need to be sorry for anything. Yes. Dr. Aksa, join कर ले please. Yes please. मैं क्या बैठी थी कोई और काम कर रही हूँ मुझे साथ साथ
and this from I will take this from here. Take it, please take this. Thank you.